Good morning, everyone. It's just a minute or so before time to begin, I think. So as we prepare to look at our study again, I hope you can join us. Um, we are still looking at Matthew, and today I had teased you last week that I had something sort of special and interesting to tell you about today's lesson. And I think you'll find that to be true. Now, when we talk about end times and things like that, you have to realize that there's a lot of people that make predictions and, and say what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Uh, I don't like to be one of those people. But from a ministerial standpoint, I don't think there's anything wrong with reading the Scripture and just pointing out some of the things it says and some and an interpretation, and that's what I'll do today. Because I think I said this last week, but I wanted to say it again. When I was going through my education in seminary and uh, in my doctoral program, I had a tendency to listen to what I was told and then to repeat it. Uh, and I have to confess that sometimes in repeating what I was told, I didn't always research it because I trusted my teachers and it's not that they were misleading it's just that they were following tradition and as I've gotten a little older and I guess you'd say a little less trustful of tradition uh, I find some things in the interpretation that I don't know it's just sort of opened my eyes a little bit and made me stop and think um, one of these is here in Matthew Matthew 24 verse 32. <clears throat> now this is the lesson from the fig tree. And I'm going to tell you how it's been taught. And I'm going to tell you what I think may be a new interpretation. Because uh, I haven't heard anybody else talk like this or talk about it this way. And it's this. We start off, it says, Jesus is speaking. He says, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Now, a couple of things in there that have been interpreted in trouble, people. First of all, the initial thing is Jesus saying, if you want to know the when the end times will be, generally speaking, Take a lesson from the fig tree. Well, you can't take that literally because that means every time a fig tree blossoms, it could be the time of the second coming. But you have to understand this from the Old Testament. Um, the fig tree was a symbol of Israel. So what he's saying is, look at Israel. And when Israel begins to blossom, now, what that means is when Israel begins to come back into place. Now, there we're talking about restoration. And restoration is one of the themes, particularly the Old Testament. It's also in the New Testament. I've got the scriptures I want to read you about restoration. Uh, Amos 9 is a good one. Amos chapter 9, verse 11 says, In that day... I will raise up the tabernacle of God that has fallen, close up the breaches thereof. I will raise up its ruins. I will build it as in the days of old. I'll bring back the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be plucked up out of their land, which I have given them, saith Jehovah my God. Now, Amos is making a prophecy, and oftentimes, and I've even said this, that a lot of the Old Testament prophets were talking about the future, uh, primarily the 61 to 73 war, where Jerusalem is destroyed, and then finally again in 132 and 33, when the city is not only torn down, but rebuilt as a uh, Roman city. But he said something here that, sort of changes that opinion because when he says I'll put them in their land they will no more be plucked up out of their land he's not talking about those time periods because Israel was taken out of their land 
So he's looking to the day of the Lord, which is the ultimate end times. And he's saying that Israel be, will be reestablished and they'll never be taken away again. So he's obviously talking about uh, the reestablishment or the restoration. Uh, in Jeremiah 16, it says, But as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where they had banished them, and the, we know that the banishment occurred under the Romans called the dispersion. For I will restore them to their own land, which I gave them, I mean, which I gave their fathers. Now, there's been a couple of dispersions. Jeremiah, I personally think, was talking about the Babylonian dispersion. Uh, the Babylonians took some of the people, some of the people escaped to the north, uh, and then they were restored by Cyrus. But some look at that and they say, well, you know, that's talking about the banishment. That's what the Romans did. So that could be talking about the apocalyptic end times day of the Lord also. Uh, and I'll grant that. Uh, but the key here is the idea of restoring Israel. Israel was restored several times because it was defeated uh, several times. And uh, we, we look primarily at the restoration after uh, Agrippa, Herod Agrippa took over. Um, and we think, well, that was the big restoration. But really it's not. The end time restoration we have been able to see. Uh, maybe some of you weren't born, but uh, I was pretty close. And that's in 1948 was when Israel was partially restored. And I'll explain that. But... Another thing about this restoration I think is important. Remember I told you that Matthew was gathering the teachings of Jesus. And he wasn't necessarily in chronological order. And I, I basically believe that a lot of the things he was putting in here about end times was a collection of Jesus' teachings. And some of them I think happened uh, in the 40 days after he was resurrected. And I have a little bit of proof of that. If you look at Acts chapter 1 verse 6. And also I want to point out, think about this. This is where Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. So what I'm about to read you is the very last thing that was on the disciples' mind before Jesus disappeared. And their question is this. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now think about that. They have gone through the crucifixion, the resurrection, and now they're with Jesus for the past 40 days. And what's on their mind? Restoring the kingdom of Israel. That sort of puts you in a mindset to know that that's what people, that's what the Jews were thinking about. Even when Jesus, you know, proved that he was not going to be the type of king they wanted. He wasn't going to be a conqueror. He wasn't going to get rid of the Romans. Uh, he basically was setting up a kingdom not of this world, but of the spiritual world. And still the disciples, in their heart of hearts, want to see Israel restored. Well, Jesus says something which is echoed uh, in Matthew 24, in verse, uh, where is it, 35? I can read that. 36. Jesus says to him in Acts, he said, um, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. So basically, Jesus isn't dodging the question. He's saying it's not for you to know because he's already said in one teaching, nobody knows. Uh, he even said, he said, I don't know. Now, that's troubled some people because they think, oh, wait a minute, Jesus is God in flesh. Of course he knows. Well, what it's saying basically is that the date hadn't been set. Now, this is troubling, too, because they think, well, no, God knows everything. But there's some things that God does that limits himself. And we see this, all, we've seen it already, where over there where it says, unless the days had been cut short, no one would have been saved. But, well, if I plan to go mow the grass, and it's getting a little hot, and I think, well, I'll do that tomorrow. My intention was to mow the grass today, but... Something hindered me, and I changed my mind. People say, oh, God doesn't change his mind. Well, yes, he does. That's all through the Old Testament where he 
he changes his mind when he's talking to Moses. He's going to destroy Israel. At one point, Moses said, oh, please don't do that. It'll make you look bad. And so he changed his mind. So in issues like this, God can do what God wants to do. We need to keep that in mind. And basically what Jesus is saying is nobody knows when, probably because that date depends on you. Because Jesus already told them the Great Commission. And in this verse, it says, And after he said these things, he ascended into heaven. So this was the last conversation he had about restoration. Now, if you look over in chapter 3 of Acts, there's another interesting statement. It says, Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped out in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke of through the mouth of his prophets. Now, a couple of points in there. He is talking at the temple, and he's telling the people, you crucified the Messiah, but we're not holding that against you because these things had to happen, as the prophet said, and that the Christ, or the Messiah that was given to you, uh, whom heaven had to receive, and heaven did receive him, he ascended into heaven, he said that he'll receive him until the period of restoration. So Peter is telling the people, he said, that Israel will be restored. Now that's going to be unusual, people, because they're familiar with what the prophets said, but they're standing in Jerusalem, actually literally standing in the temple. And Peter's saying, and when all this is restored, they're probably thinking, what do you mean restored? It's, it's still here. But he was speaking prophetically because Jesus had told them that it was going to be torn down. And sure enough, uh, not many years after this, uh, Titus came in, tore down the temple, wiped out the city, drove the people out. Uh, and the ones that left uh, were part of the early dispersion. And then they came back around 132, and they found Jews there, and they ultimately sent them all away. Uh, and the Romans had a way of doing things. Now, I know people say, oh, they sent them to Egypt. Some were sent to Egypt. But not the whole population, because we have Jews showing up in Europe right after this. Whole cities, colonies, you might say. They were sent to Gaul, which is today France. They were sent to Germany, uh, that over <clears throat> between Germany and Eastern Europe. Some were even sent away as far away as Britain. Wherever the Romans had a, an army or a garrison, uh, they would send people there. Uh, a good point of this is I mentioned Gaul. If you go to uh, Asia Minor, or what we today call Turkey, there was a section in there made up of people from Gaul. Because when Caesar conquered the Gaelic people of Gaul, people of Gaul, what they later will be called the Franks, he sent a bunch of them to Turkey. And they were, they were a colony. Paul talks about speaking to Galatians. Well, those are Franks, or are people of Gaul. They were in Spain. They were in North Africa, Libya. Rome had a, uh, a way of doing things. They said, well, if you want to keep rebellion down, send the leaders of rebellion so far away well, they'll never come back. And it, it worked. It was very effective. And so the Jews had been rebellious, so they said, spread them everywhere. Get these people out. And by the way, uh, Hadrian came in as emperor about that time. He said, I don't want them coming back. I want to build a temple to Jupiter right here where their temple was. And he did. And he also said, I don't want any Jews alive back in this place. And so it became, I told you, I think last week, Capitolina. And Capitolina was built there, but an earthquake, of all things, destroyed it. And once it was destroyed, they forgot about it. Uh, and so Jerusalem sat there basically just as mostly ruins until uh, Constantine, mother actually, came and they wanted to search out for holy sites. The city was being built back up by Muslims. And then the Crusaders came. And we got that whole history. But the, the, actually the Crusaders were much later. Uh, but Constantine's mother went. And they started building up holy sites. Uh, they rebuilt some of the walls. So if you look at a picture of Israel today. You see this temple mount with this big beautiful wall around it. That's not the original temple wall. Uh, that's the Byzantine walls as they call it. Uh, mostly built by Suleiman. And um, they're not exactly where the old wall was, uh, but I won't get into that right now because I want to get back to this, 
this section about the fig tree. I know I've digressed away from it a lot. But Jesus is telling us to look at the fig tree and the restoration. Well, the restoration of Israel happened in 1948. And here's the part that I think a lot of biblical interpreters miss. Jesus said, as soon as the branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know the summer is near. Now that's talking about an agricultural reading. If you go out and you see a fig tree and the branches get soft and they begin to sprout leaves, you know that it's springtime, summer is coming. Jesus is using the idea of summer as you know, that something is coming, but it's not there yet. So when the branches begin to sprout leaves is not the sign of the end times. It's the sign that the end time is near. And there's where a lot of people made a mistake because they said, oh, well, 1948, the, the, the restoration occurred. And then Jesus says this, which has really thrown, thrown people for a loop. Later on, he says in 34, he says, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. That confusion created the idea that people have said, well, Jesus was talking about the generation right there. It makes no sense to take that, but for some reason people interpreted it as such. Jesus was not talking about the current generation, but there's implications in some of the writings that the disciples thought, that means Jesus is coming back real soon. Um, there was, well, when Jesus ascended, there was this constant looking and constant preaching that let's get ready because Jesus is coming soon. Paul picked up on the same idea. And Paul went around telling people, he said, we've got to get ready. Jesus is going to come back soon. The only problem was they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about when he said this generation. He said this generation, not, not applying to the generation he was in, but the generation that saw the restoration of Israel. Well, Israel was still there when they, he said this, so there's no restoration. Jesus was talking about the ultimate end times. And we made the mistake of seeing that and think, oh, 1948, 48, Israel's back. That generation will not perish. But it's been, I think last week I mistakenly said uh, 50 years. It's actually been more like, let's see, 1940, 2060. It's been like 80 years. So we get in the idea of what is a generation? And people say, well, a generation is just like 30 years. Some say, oh, no, it's 50 and others say, no, a generation is 100 years. I don't know many 100-year-old people. But the idea is that they mistake, made a mistake again. Uh, now, that's me talking. I'm not trying to think to say that I know everything. But there's just some things that have jumped out at me that seem to be, I don't know, glaring. Jesus was talking about a generation that wouldn't pass away. But he says that, it's going to sprout leaves, and you'll know that summer is near. Okay, look at it this way. Look, there's a three-fold occurrence. The first thing, Israel is returned, that the kingdom of Israel, not, not the kingdom part of it, but the nation of Israel, 1948, that is a tender shoot. That's some leaves sprouting. What Jesus is saying, hey, 1948, you see this happening? Summer's going to be near, but summer's not here. Now, something occurred, I think it was last year, or maybe the year before, that a lot of people thought, well, that's a major political thing, but they forgot to think of it in terms of biblical prophecy. It's even more major. You see, back to restoration, what was being restored? The kingdom of Israel, but specifically the kingdom of David. You see, the prophets all spoke of the promise to David that someone of the line of David would sit upon the throne and that the kingdom of David would be restored. All right, 1948, Israel got some land. It was not the kingdom of David. It was just some land. In 19, I think it was the 67 war, Israel took back almost all of what was at one time the kingdom of David. But they had to give it back. So it wasn't established. But I think it was 2019, wasn't it? You, you might want to correct me. Something amazing happened, and that was uh, Donald Trump sent our embassy to Jerusalem. Now, what's the big deal? Well, just every president in the past, I think six, have said, oh yeah, we're going to put our embassy in Jerusalem, because that's symbolic. 
If you put the embassy in a city, that is saying that city is the capital. Jerusalem has never been considered the capital of Israel, not even in 1948. The Jews wanted to say that, but the world did not recognize that. And the Muslims said, no, that's the capital of the Muslim part. See, the Muslims controlled most of Jerusalem right up until, uh, well, I forget the, the year the war happened, but it might have been 67 when uh, they captured the west side of the Jordan and they captured all of Jerusalem. And they told the Muslims, they said, this is our city. Well, the Palestinians, I shouldn't say Muslims, the Palestinians uh, have argued that and said, no, no, this is our city. This is our capital city. Uh, you have taken it and usurped it. So we've had this, this issue going on for quite some time. But um, when Trump sent the embassy there, he became the first nation in history since the first century to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now, you say, oh, well, that's it. That's the ticking clock. Actually, no, there's still another part to this prophecy. If you look at all what the Old Testament, and even the New Testament, that talks about restoration, Israel must be put in place. Jerusalem must be the capital, because that was David's capital, uh, particularly the old city of Zion. That's where David's throne was. Uh, the Revelation, book of Revelation talks about a temple. Well, folks, there's no temple yet. So people say, oh, well, the second coming is going to be any day. Uh, I don't think so, or we'd be inconsistent with what the Bible says about the temple. Uh, there is going to be some type of temple. Um, now, where is it going to be? There's a lot of good evidence to suggest that it's not on the Temple Mount, but I, I've sort of touched on that, and a lot of people think that's kooky, but I'm, I don't know. I'm getting a little more convinced the more I study it. But the third thing, the third thing to look for is the restoration of David's kingdom. I'm talking boundaries. It, it happened in 67, but it wasn't solidified. It wasn't recognized by anyone. And here's where it gets a little sticky, because if you look at the kingdom of David, it wasn't just one day it was Palestine, the next day it was David's kingdom. David's kingdom was established through war. He took land. He was actually fulfilling what God told Moses to do. Now, interesting thing, if you look most, at most of the ancient maps of the kingdom of David, the only thing it doesn't take is an area called Philistia, which is down near, guess what, Gaza. And so Gaza is not a part. That's where the Palestinians live. The Palestinians, though, want to claim the West Bank, but that's where the Jordan River and Western Jerusalem are. Uh, that belongs to the Israelis now. Now, there's a lot of protests. They fight about it. Uh, but if you look at the original outlay, you'll see some interesting things. And you have to think, well, which one should we go by? Because David's kingdom at one point stretched across the Jordan River all the way to Damascus, all the way, well, that's actually north, into Syria. And his kingdom held the southern part of Syria, Lebanon, uh, the eastern part of Jordan, all the way down to Elat uh, on the, the Sinai Gulf. Uh, didn't go to Egypt. The promise was all the way to the river Euphrates, uh, but he never quite achieved that. But if we look at the kingdom, that means that Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon are going to have to give up some land. Um, that doesn't seem possible. But another map is out there for you to study, and that is the kingdom that David left Solomon. And that one's interesting. Um, you can Google that, you know, Solomon's kingdom or David's kingdom. You'll see these different maps. But Solomon's kingdom looks very much like the boundaries of today's Israel. And that's what David left for Solomon. It's not completely intact because it takes in some areas along the Jordan that are still part of the Jordan country, Jordan. Uh, but if, if we were to see Jordan allow Israel to annex uh, all of the West Bank, which they're doing. Uh, there are Palestinians there who are arguing about it, but Israel's building settlements in the West Bank, and that's been a real touchy spot. Uh, they've also moved north above the Sea of Galilee, which is part of Solomon's kingdom. Uh, they've moved down to the Gulf uh, of Elat, 
if I'm pronouncing that correctly. At one time they had the whole of Sinai, but they backed out of that, which is in keeping with Solomon's kingdom. So what am I saying? Three things. The establishment, that happened in 48. The capital, that happened in 2019, I think. Now we've got to see the boundaries. Now, when Israel becomes uh, bounded by the city of, or bounded by the kingdom of David, I would suggest that that's when the clock starts ticking, and that generation will be the generation that will not pass away. When is that going to happen? Guess what? Nobody knows. Uh, it could happen soon. It could also go on for years and years and years. Um, my instincts are that we are closer than any generation, but you can say that very easily. That doesn't mean that it's going to be you know, before I die or before my children die. Um, but it, Jesus is trying to tell us about the second coming without being too vague. Uh, I think his advice is best. So let me read it to you because he tells his disciples, he said, Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Well, that's pretty definite. Uh, neither angels, heaven, nor the Son, except the Father alone, as the days of Noah, as the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. He compares that to the days of Noah, because in the days of Noah, we know that by the story that Noah's building an ark, and the people are just going about their daily lives. Now, we've seen movies where everybody comes and laughs at him and stuff. That may have happened, I don't know. But the Bible basically says that Noah's over here building an ark. Everybody else is going on. They're marrying, they're partying, they're doing all this stuff. And then suddenly, the flood comes. Now, we have these ideas of like, well, it starts raining, and then gradually the water comes up and stuff like that. Uh, the, I guess you say the archaeological evidence doesn't really support that. Uh, it talks about a pretty rapid flood. Now, I don't... I don't think it was a global flood in the fact that the waters of the whole country rose over the mountaintops. I mean, the whole of the whole world. That's not possible because we didn't have that much water. But what we have evidence of, pretty strong evidence, is floods around the globe. Something happened catastrophically that created flooding, and it occurred everywhere. But I don't think it was at the same time. You'll see it in... The American Hemisphere, you see it in Asia, you see it in the Middle East. Um, massive floods, and they seem to be very rapidly occurring. People were caught unaware. Um, so I think the scriptures are right. So what does Jesus tell us? He talks about the days of Noah. And he said they didn't know the flood uh, until the flood came and swept them away. They didn't know anything about it. Just like one day, it's like, oh man, here comes a flood. Um this is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. That's verse 39. And then he goes into the idea of like two men will be on the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding. One will be taken, one left. And verse 42, Jesus tells us what we should be doing. He says, therefore, be alert. Since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. But know this. If the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. This is why you are also to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, people have tried to make a lot out of that, and they said, Oh, when do I expect Jesus? Oh, well, I would expect him at this time and this time and this time. Uh, we can have all the expectations we want. But Jesus says, It's going to be a surprise. Uh, you know, you can expect it in the morning time or when the sun rises. I've seen people say, oh, it's going to be on a solar eclipse or it's going to be on an equinox. It's going to be in the spring. It's going to be in the winter. Folks, we don't know. And you know what? And it's going to make you sort of think, well, why are we doing this study? We shouldn't be so closed mind about thinking that's the only thing we have to think about. He says, be ready. And right after this, Matthew puts parables. Now, again, I doubt if these parables came right after the Olivet Discourse. I think probably Matthew was thinking that Jesus had taught these things, and then at other times he had taught parables that go along with this. And he's getting ready to teach about uh, the servant 
that was doing his job, the ten virgins that were prepared. Uh, these parables all are what we call eschatological parables. They're, they're symbols of the end time, so they fit there. Now, Matthew, as a writer, has put this into an order to help us understand. Uh, nothing wrong with doing that. People do that all the time. Writers do it because they're taking the teaching of Jesus. But as I said, I think probably a lot of these teachings happened after the resurrection because 40 days he was there teaching the disciples more. And you see themselves, the last thing on their mind is about restoration. What about the restoration? You know, your second coming, we get that. Is that when you're going to restore it? And when's that going to happen? That was their interest. Um, and Jesus was trying to say, you got work to do. Go ye into all the world. Don't go check in the calendar. Don't go sit around praying for an insight. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing a study like this. But what the bottom line of the study should reveal to us is that there is going to be a day of the Lord. Jesus is coming back. That's the thing you should take from this. Not time, hour, and minute. But Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, do you want to be sitting on top of a mountain with your suitcase? Or do you want to be out doing the work of God? Because if you're sitting and waiting, then you're going to be like the, the worthless servant. We not, we're not sitting and waiting. We should be going and working. We should be sharing our thoughts, our research. Uh, for old people like me, you know, it's a time for writing and, and sharing. For young people, it's a time of going. That's why it says that you know, old men will dream dreams and young people do all this stuff. Um, that's our mandate. Our mandate is to have the faith in Christ, believe in the second coming, and tell others. Don't be like Noah sitting over here working hard on this ark uh, and not telling his neighbors what's going to happen. Now, I really don't know if that happened that way, but it's sort of like saying we shouldn't be packing our bags and planning our trip in heaven and you know what we're going to get. We should be focused on who can I share this with? Who can I help get to heaven? Uh, there are people out there that we know and love that are doing just what Jesus said. They were eating, drinking, getting married, they're having a good time. They, they worry more about how they're going to get to the river on Saturday than how they get to church on Sunday. Our job is not to be, I guess you say, cruel and condemning. Our job is to be confrontational and say, this is the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. If we shy away from that, if we're afraid of offending people by telling them the truth, then we are salt that's lost its savor. We are light hidden under a bushel. Uh, we should be unashamed to speak the gospel to anyone willing to listen. And there's the hard part, because a lot of people just shut you down immediately and say, you're crazy, you're a kook, I don't want to hear this. That's the lesson today. Um, and like I said, I've thrown some things at you that uh, not a lot of scholars, I haven't seen anybody talk about the three phase of the establishment of Israel, the Jerusalem capital, and the establishment of the kingdom borders. Uh, so I could be wrong. I'm not the smartest man in the world. It's just you read it and it seems to me that it's jumping out at you and saying that we're not trying to figure out the exact day, but we can see the signs. And when we see the signs, we should realize it's coming soon. We should be, as Jesus said, be ready. Be working. Be watching. Now, I'm going to stop. Uh, I've given you a lot to think about again. And I actually like doing that. I hope it doesn't bother you a whole lot. Uh, but now it comes to another time. A time for prayer. In our prayer today, we have a lot of things to pray for. Yesterday was the 4th of July. Everybody was shooting fireworks. Um, today's the 5th of July. What do we do on the 5th of July? The 4th is over. Well, 4th may have been a time of celebration, but the 5th is a time for prayer. Our nation is going through some tough times right now. We have groups in this country that are trying to fundamentally change us. And, and that word sounds intelligent, but it's not. Because when you change the fundamentals of a nation, the fundamentals of this nation was one nation under God. Now, I know that wasn't added to the pledge until the 50s, but it's part of our original documents. You read the Declaration. You read the Bill of Rights. It's all about freedom. It's all about God-given. You study Washington. People say, oh, he was a deist. 
Well, he was just a deist because he chose to believe in God, but he didn't choose to follow a certain congregation. But he never denied God, and the man was a man of prayer. We need to be people of prayer, praying to this country, praying that those who would change us fundamentally, because it's a cloaked word. Change us fundamentally means the fundamentals of this country are God and freedom. Do you want to change those things? you want to take them away? We need to pray. Pray that God can move in the hearts of people to let them realize that we are a free nation. We need to remain a free nation. We are unique in all the world. And if America goes down, there will be nobody left. That's another thing to study, but I won't get into that. I just want to say today is a day of prayer for our country. It's also a day of prayer for our sick. Uh, I mentioned Carolyn last week. Uh, Davis told me that she's home, but she's going to be on dialysis dialysis for three days a week, which is nothing to look forward to, but it is a life-saving technique. Uh, there are others that are sick, and, and folks you know who I'm talking about, uh, we've got plenty of people on our prayer list at church. So look at that prayer list. Look in your own family and share these things with one another and lift these people up in prayer. And I always tell people, I said, let your prayer be this, that God's will be done. I mean, our prayer is always to to heal the sick and save the lost. But my prayer should be, or our prayer should be, that God's will be done because our will may be flawed, but God's will is perfect. So let's take a moment to pray. If you join me now. Heavenly Father, first I come offering you our praise. I praise you, God, for all the things that you are and all the things that you've shown us and all the things that you've done for us. And I thank you, God, for these things. May praise and thanksgiving be always on my lips. And Lord, may it come with forgiveness. For I know that I fail you. I am a weak person. I am a sinner. But through your grace, I have known God's love. And I thank you for that. Help me, God, to be stronger. Help me to be the, a, a person that you can look at and say, Well done, my faithful servant. You've heard the prayer request today. We seek to pray for our nation for the peace of the nation. We pray for Israel too, for the peace of Israel, because they're in the crosshairs also. And we pray for our sick. We pray for those that are grieving today at loss. We pray for those that are sick and concerned about treatments they have to go through and those that are worried about COVID-19, uh, the, the coronavirus. Lord, all these things we place in your hands because our hands aren't big enough to hold them and we can't fix them. But we know that your guidance, your leadership, and your love can show us how to work. So God, I ask these things in your name. I ask God that you would be within us. And as I, I always like to say, helping us to become the people that you want us to be. Not the people that we want to be, but the people that you want us to be. The people you created us to be. So God bless us in that way. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We'll be back. Next Sunday morning at 9.30, continuing our study. Uh, I want to look at these parables just briefly before we move on. Uh, but I also encourage you, uh, if you don't have a church home, First Baptist Church will be online. Uh, and you can go to church if you like. We're uh, meeting in the fellowship hall. You can go in. They'll take your temperature and give you a mask and find you a uh, seat that's not so clustered together. Randy Hatcher, our pastor, will be bringing the message today. He's going to be talking, I think, about the theme of freedom, and uh, it's from Philippians. He's still in Philippians. So Randy, uh, he's doing a good series, and I encourage you to watch Randy and listen to him uh, at 11 o'clock. He's a good fella. If you get a chance, send me an email. Uh, uh, good fella and good friend. So if you have your own church, I'm sure you feel the same towards your pastor, and I, I'm just, I say great. Go go to church or tune in online. Uh don't forsake the opportunity. Uh, I have to admit it, I'm enjoying this home church thing because I get to go to church in my recliner. Uh, that's great for me. But seriously, uh, that'll be coming up at 11. I thank you for watching today. And like I said, we'll be back next Sunday to continue this study. And I'll see you then. Thank you.